Welcome everyone to this edition of Verifiability Talk. It's my honor to introduce our speaker today, Knut Okeson. Uh, Knut is a professor of automation at Chalmers University of Technology, and he's someone who likes to apply rigorous techniques uh, to uh, verification and also synthesis of uh, critical automation systems. Uh, he is an expert in controller synthesis, but uh, he has also applied it um, to various verification problems and falsification. And also he has collaborated a lot with different industries, including the automotive industry. Uh, so Knut, thank you very much for having accepted our invitation and the floor is yours. Yeah, it's my pleasure to uh, thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, yeah, so uh, as, as um, you mentioned here, I, I um, sort of try to combine more um, rigorous methods with uh, applied problems and we have a not a long history working with the industry for different uh, different problems. Uh, and today I will talk about uh, our collaboration with uh, Volvo Cars specifically, where we uh, have act we have one PhD student, Johan Lidia Nederland, that is employed at Volvo, but is uh, doing the PhD in our our group. Uh, and um, so we'll talk about his uh, research. Uh, and then I will also talk about what uh, Sahara Ramesani is, is uh, Doing that is also um, working on on similar problems. Uh, so uh, I did um, write down the title here: model-based test me methods for cyber-physical systems. And it's model-based because we assume that we have a model, but the model we we assume that we can simulate the system. Um, that's all. So we can select new inputs to the system and we can observe the outputs, but we don't really know anything more about the system. Uh, and uh, I, I wrote down the cyber physical systems because uh, what we really care about here is systems that uh, consist of um, uh, both uh, controllers, so PID and uh, model predictive controllers uh, that are then interacting with some, some physics that you have built up model from that we also simulate. Uh, so, uh, let's see how I can change. Right. So, we are dealing with, with cars, uh, and really what we're interested in this connection between the software containing the controllers and the physical components. And this is sort of safety critical um, systems in many cases. Uh, and the main challenge here is that we have not only discrete variables, uh, but we have uh, continuous variables and they are governed by typically by differential equations. So, uh, so these are uh, sort of impossible to, to do with to solve with model checking methods. Um, and uh, they are very difficult to test efficiently. And I think industry, they are really trying to go from writing manual test cases that they have been using for a long time and, and instead go into to see if they can have more structured structured methods in, in coming up with these test cases that, that are better at finding these uh, sort of tricky situations that can happen and you find out when you have sent out the car to a customer. Uh, and specifically, we are working with Volvo Car Corporation, as I mentioned, and uh, the group doing the electric propulsion system. Uh, so that's a good group to work with because they uh, are a little bit more free to try out with new new methods since they are or started from more or less scratch. Um, so the real uh, models that we are working with uh, is the battery, the inverter and the battery management system. Uh, so when we have a project uh, fun, uh, funded by the Swedish Vinova uh, government agency, and that's called Testron, and then we also have a, a, another project called SciTech, which is uh, more for, for basic research in, in, in this field. Uh, so, uh, so I wanted to say a little bit about what, what kind of, how do we describe these systems? Uh, and in when you do doing control and in the industry, uh, you do or Simulink, MATLAB, and Simulink are the very common commonly used tools. Uh, so uh, the so so this is what Volvo is is using right now. So they have 
you, the control algorithms expressed in, in MATLAB Simulink, and they have the physical environment uh, expressed using uh, uh, a language called Simscape, uh, which allows you to very quickly build up good models of the physical environment. So, so the mechanics, the electrical parts, uh, and their interaction. Uh, but these systems do also contain uh, a lot of other things like device drivers, etc., written written in C. So, so this is what what we have to deal with. Um, we we can't really change this. Uh, so, but we what we can do is that we can simulate the, these models, uh, and this is used for uh, for different purposes. So, uh, so these simulations models are used to when they do model based control design. So th this is why they started to build uh, these models of the physics and to design the controllers. Uh, they can also be used in, in these more modern, model predictive controllers where you actually use the model of the, the system to optimize control signals that are best according to some cost criteria. And they use it for simulation and validation, of course, that they do the right thing. But now when they have invested so much in building up these models, so then we have the possibility to use these models also for, for testing. Uh, and really what we try to do here is that uh, we assume that we are given a model of a controller, for example, in, Sim, uh, in Simulink, uh, we have the model of the physical plant, and we have the model of the requirements that the system should, should satisfy. And later on, I will talk about that we, we model them using signal temporal logic. Uh, but the, the overall question we would like to, to uh, answer is, are there uh, parameters to the system, for example, input signals, such that the requirements are bio violated or not? Uh, and at Volvo, we have, uh, also when we started this work, we, um, we uh, started to see, okay, what is out there in the community? And... Uh, we came across these um, methods built, use, built on falsification methods, and there are a couple of different systems, um, for example, Estalero uh, and Breach. Uh, and eventually we decided on, on building it on top of, of Breach. So all the algorithms are that I will talk about today, we have implemented in Breach, and we're also working with the original developer, Alexander Donza, uh, of, of um, yeah, implementing and further extending uh, breach. Uh, <clears throat> and both Estalero and breach are based on this assumption that you can simulate the system, but you have no more knowledge about the system than, than that, that you can simulate it. Uh, so, uh, so we have uh, at Volvo, we have um, built a version of this and, and Volvo uh, have come up with the name Magic Tester, so they call it. So it's uh, so we have it up and running. We have it integrated in their uh, in their tool chain. So every, whenever they submit new code, um, this um, tool that we I will talk about today uh, are starting to try to falsify the specifications that we have. So there is a small cluster and, and uh, that keeps on then automatically generating these test cases. Uh, using uh, optimization here. Uh, so, but what is the, in, in more detail, what is the approach that we have? So this is sort of an overall uh, structure of the approach. Um, and I will talk a little bit about the different blocks here. Uh, and this is, this, this is the same approach for, um, for Breach and uh, Estalero. Uh, they work essentially the same way, but they, they differ in the dif in the details. Uh, but up here we have a generator, so that is the input generator, so that that will decide on what the input signals to the system should look like. And this is something that we try to those input signals we try to change such that we are more likely to falsify. Uh, a requirement or a specification, if that is possible. But when we have these input generators, we generate the input signals that we send to the simulator. So this is now in, in at Volvo. This is uh, Simulink with Simscape and uh, C code. Uh, but 
there is really nothing in in the approach we we use here that is specific to this. We we can we can any system that we can simulate would would do here do well. Uh, but so after we have simulated, we uh, <coughs> observe the output, and then we have something called the robustness function that, given a requirement and uh, yeah, both the inputs and outputs actually calculate some. Uh, uh, value that we call the robustness value and this is defined in such a way that if the robustness value is less than zero then we have falsified the specification if it's positive then the uh, specification is is uh, fulfilled so and as soon as we have found uh, one set of uh, input signals that will falsify the spec then we have a counter example then and we can terminate uh, but if if the input signals are still satisfying the specification. Then we go through what is called the parameter optimizer. So now we try to, to uh, observe these objective values the, or these robustness values, and we try to change uh, the inputs in such a way that we are more likely to falsify the specification in the next iteration uh, of this loop. So. Uh, uh, and then this goes on until we run out of the uh, simulation budget. Um, or if we have some other criteria, if we have fulfilled some some um, coverage criteria, for example, that, that says like that now it's time to to stop uh, doing this falsification. Uh, but then I will talk a little bit about these input generators first. So because this is important, because we these are the parameters that we change with the optimizer. Uh, and you see here, so uh, we need to generate these input signals, and that's the signals, so they are changing over time. Uh, and what we do is that we uh, parameterize uh, these input signals, uh, and then we adjust these parameters using the optimizer. So each input signal is uh, characterized by a finite number of control points. Um, and these input signals or these control points are set up by the test engineers at Volvo Car. So, so because that's also a, uh, an important problem to understand what kind of inputs do make sense for that particular application, because you don't want to generate uh, counter examples with really weird input signals that they would just say that okay, this can never happen in practice. So, so there is some engineering needed here to come up with these that are sort of reasonable input signals. So, but they are parameterized, and what we see here is that um, we have in this case three different control points, and then that we interpolate the, the signal between these control points. So uh, what the optimizer then can do is to change the value of these three control points. And there are then different kind of uh, parameterizations that we can do. So, for example, if we have a sinusoid, we can parameterize that with using uh, the amplitude and uh, the period, for example. So we have two inputs. Um, uh, and I will also talk about another parameterization that we found useful, which is called the pulse generator a little bit later in today's talk. Uh, but this is what we do with all the inputs. Uh, and if we now uh, continue to uh, to this robustness function, which uh, is used to calculate a robustness value after we have simulated the system with these inputs. And, and when we do calculate this value, we also take the requirement or the specification into account. So then it's important to understand how do we model these requirements. Uh, and what we do use is uh, an extension of uh, temporal logic or linear temporal logic to also include time and uh, allow us to write predicates using continuous variables. So time is, of course, important in these applications. So something should happen within a certain time window, window for example. Uh, and uh, we also have continuous variables because we typically we compared, um, for example, speed or torque and, 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 and other things 
that we need to have in, in our specifications. So, uh, so this single temporal logic is like you have the normal operators, so uh, and an or, and then you have the, these extensions that you have in linear temporal operators, like always, uh, eventually, and until. Um, but the difference here is that compared to normal temporal logic is that you can uh, specify specific time intervals in which something should, should happen. So, for example, in the timed always uh, case that we see here, well, let me see here, I can. Um, uh, we say that always within uh, the time starting at, at time A to the time B, this, uh, this property uh, phi should hold. Uh, and uh, with an SDL, then you can say if the specification is fulfilled or not, but we will also associate a robustness value to, the, to this, this, this formula. So, but I will try to give a concrete example first. So, an extremely simple specification would be to say that okay, the velocity should always be below 100. And since we're doing simulation, we have a start time and we have an end time of the simulation. So, in this case, capital T is the end time of the simulation. So, then we can write the specifications that, that says that always from time zero to capital T, this um, the velocity should be less than 100. Uh, so, and of course, this is relatively straightforward to evaluate if you have inputs and outputs of your system. Uh, but uh, the, the tricky part is how do we uh, uh, assign these robustness values uh, of the, these specifications? And there are different ideas of how to do that. But, but uh, a basic idea is that you can, uh, can for example, look at uh, if you have these three, what you see here, these three simulations, and if the specification was that uh, uh, the velocity should always be less than 100, then I think most would say that this, the third example here, is closer to falsifying the specification. So what we could do is to, to uh, for example, try to have some measure here between this uh, this value 100 and the largest value of, of B. Uh, so, um, so you then can, can, for example, if you look at this smallest value, then you can uh, get a robustness value. So in this case, the largest value was 50 and uh, 100 was, was the uh, case that you had to, or the value that you had to stay less than. So then the robustness value in this case would be 50 because you are 50 units away from violating the specification. And in this case, you would it would be 20 because the largest value was 80 and this would, would be 8. Uh, so, so, so in some sense, you would like to, when you do your optimization, you would like to change the inputs that resulted in these outputs here, in this output speed, um, so that you, you sort of increase this, uh, this value a bit. Um, so that's, and, and that, that is sort of the tricky part of this entire problem. So how do you do that? Because you don't really know when you change the inputs, how did that really affect this, this uh, robustness value that you ended up with? Uh, and, there is a, a semantics called uh, the uh, max semantics um, that is used. Uh, this is sort of the standard semantics for defining this robustness value. Uh, and uh, the, the only drawback with that method is that it, it, it is, uh, it's only looking at the extreme values. So if, for example, if you have a situation like this, there are two different simulations here. Um, so if you here you are close to violating the specification twice on the right hand side than what you're on the left hand side here. But with the max semantics, you would uh, calculate the same, same robustness value. So what we try to do is to, to see could we come up with other definitions of, uh, or, or of this uh, quantitative uh, semantics 
that that um, will say that uh, what we have on the right hand here is is sort of a little bit worse than what we have on the on the left hand side. Um, right, and I will see. I forgot to say that you see here. So I, I started by saying that the robustness values are defined in such a way that if if the value is negative, then it's the, the specification is falsified, and if it's positive, then it's uh, the specification is fulfilled. So in this case, you see uh, yeah, the robustness value is zero. And if we could change the inputs such that we had one of them go below zero here, then we would have a counterexample. Uh, so we did play around uh, a bit with this, and we come did come up with um, uh, something that we called additive semantics. Um, uh, that will say that the, what we have on the right hand side is a little bit more sensitive. So, so this, this, since this value is then used by the optimizer, um, it's important to, to, to give the right information to the optimizer, how to, I mean, to guide the optimizer in the right direction. Um, uh, right. Uh, and something that we also looked into when we did these experiments, so that is talked in this paper, is about if we then find a counterexample, how do we, how do we, we would like to find as simple counterexamples as possible that violate the specifications? And th this is sort of convenient for the test engineers that are receiving these counterexamples. We don't want, if we can come up with a simpler test uh, test case. In, in some metric, uh, then that is in many cases to prefer by, by these engineers. Um, so, and we could combine this additive semantics with, with this simplification of the counterexamples. Uh, so, I will not go into the details here, but, uh, but if you have two expressions uh, and, and you just have an or between those two, so in the max, roman, max semantics, what will happen is that you will take the maximum value uh, of these uh, of the robustness value of these two specifications. So yeah, so if a specific either phi one or phi two, right? So so to falsify it, both has to become less than than zero because as soon as one is pos has is positive, right, then the specification is fulfilled. So and the max says that okay yeah then then we, we only consider them the maximum value so 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 these robustness values with only yeah, it is only the the specifications with the largest um, robustness value that will affect the final robustness value of the formula uh, but with additive uh, we did it in this way so we just added them together. Uh, and then when we had a and um, conjunction between two formulas, we, we calculated it in, in this way instead. And then we package everything into what we call the valued Boolean. So we can plug and play different. So we can model the max semantics and, and the additive semantics and possibly also other semantics using yeah, in, the, in the same uh, framework, so to speak. So we can play around with them. So that was all, all presented in, in, in the paper uh, on the previous slide. Uh, so, and, and we've seen in the experiments that it seems to work a little bit better for the kind of, um, for the benchmark uh, examples that we have. So there is some extra information that is used to, to guide the optimizer if you use additive instead of the max. Um, uh, robustness value. Uh, but something that, the, that it was really important for us to be able to not only run on these uh, sort of academic benchmark examples, but to be able to run these methods on the, the models they ha have at Volvo, uh, because I started to talk about that we had the specifications or requirements as signal temporal logic formula. But um, if, if you're going to have that, then you need the engineers to either start to write these specifications using signal temporal logic. And the kind of engineers that are developing these specifications are typically not computer scientists, but more control people. 
Uh, so, uh, so what was really fortunate when when uh, Johan uh, started to dig into what was what they did have at Volvo was that they they had actually specifications written using Simulink charts uh, and attached to each model. So they had a uh, many many hundred of different specifications. So, but they were not in STL. So. Uh, but these specifications were there because they worked as observers. So they could simulate the system and then they could, could see the, so the, and these uh, specifications was executed while you did run the simulation and then it ended up with basically a binary output saying that if it was falsified or if it was not falsified. Uh, so, uh, so what you want started to do was to see can we yeah, because we needed this uh, robustness value if you're going to change the input parameters, if you're going to have this optimization loop that I talked about. Uh, and yeah, so what he, what he did was to, to look into the problem of, of, of uh, transforming the Simulink uh, requirements that you had into signal temporal logic where we could associate this uh, robustness value with. Uh, and it turned out that uh, he was actually able to do that. Uh, and uh, yeah, so this, this method is um, presented uh, uh, in, in one of his early papers here. But uh, we can see here, so here we have a, um, a typical specification, a, a simple one though. But it says that the signal X should always be within some given tolerance from the, some uh, uh, X ref, right? And this this is what they it looks like if you try to write that down in uh, in a in a simulink chart. Uh, and this is uh, relatively straightforward to express using sim signal temporal logic. So you can just say that always within this uh, defined Time interval x minus x ref should be less than the, the given to tolerance. Uh, so, what he did work on was how can you, if you are given this chart, how can you uh, generate these specifications uh, or STL formulas, formulas automatically? And this was, of course, important to do because uh, we can see here, here is a slightly more involved example uh, and uh, this is also quite typical what they look like at Volvo so you can see here to the right that we have different cases that you have a switch that will take the input different input depending on some condition and it, I mean it, it quickly grows and we can see here that if we now translate this into this signal tempo logic formula, formula it, it becomes a little bit more messy and it's not so easy to do to, to write down this manually. And if we then switch over to something that is even more complicated, but not super complicated in any way. Um, but yeah, uh, this, this formula becomes very, very large. Uh, and Johan has many examples of formulas where this is many, many hundreds lines of uh, code for just for writing this STL formula. So, it is probably, a, um, or it, it is very convenient for the engineers to be still be able to work in the modeling language that they are used to. Uh, but his method, and I will not go into the detail now, details now, but it's presented in a paper where you can do this translation automatically. Uh, and uh, this is. Uh, in fact, possible to do with some conditions for any simulink chart that they can write. And, and uh, this works so well. So for all these uh, several hundred specifications that they have at Volvo, we, we are able to translate each one of them down to, to, to STL, and then we can use this. Associate this um, quantitative semantics and generating a robustness value for every input sim, uh, sim yeah, every simulation of this system for, for any specification. Right. Uh, 
and then I switch over to the optimization part. Um, so I, I talked about that we, we solve this as an optimization problem, but this is a slightly reformulation of the problem because really what we try to do is that we try to, when we solve the falsification problem, is that we, we would like to check, does there exist a set of control points such that the robustness value uh, after the simulation becomes neg neg negative, uh, subject to some constraints on uh, these control points. And, and the assumption here we have is that they are always within uh, a, a given range. So they have a lower bound and an upper bound. Uh, but the question is, how can we can, how can we solve this uh, problem to check for the existence? And, and one way to do this is to use optimization, and we try to come up with an input input parameters that minimizes this function. And then we check if this minimum value of this function is less than zero or not. So this is why we use optimization, although we re really only care about the checking for the existence of, of solutions. Uh, uh, right, and if I can just uh, first, we 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 thought that okay, you, we didn't believe the optimization method would ma matter matter much, uh, but uh, we have been quite uh, thorough, I would say, in um, setting up and running as many uh, ex benchmark examples of as we, we have been able to find uh, where we have these specifications. Uh, and we, when we try to do these evaluation a little bit more carefully with, with the, by implementing different um, optimization methods that we found in the literature. Uh, so we started out and that was used when we started. So Nelder Mead here was the, um, uh, the default optimizer. So it's a gradient free based um, very old uh, method um, to that, yeah, I will not go into the details, but it, it's, a, it's a gradient free optimization method. Um, uh, but uh, it, it did not perform very well. Um, so we, uh, we did uh, search for other methods that would do a little bit better. And we came across something, uh, a method called SnobFit, which is, uh, model-based method, so it's sort of trying to build up surrogate functions and that will sort of guide uh, where to sample the function next. Um, and in fact, uh, SnobFit performed much better uh, than, than Elder Mead. Uh, and when we did these experiments, we, uh, we also played around with different quantitative semantics. And what we figured out was that SnobFit actually performed really well also in those situations where, where we had, uh, we just assigned value one if the spec was fulfilled and value minus one if it was not fulfilled. So, so basically there were no guidance at all uh, for the optimizer in which direction to go. Uh, and when we looked into this, we, we found out that, yeah, for many of these benchmark problems, uh, it turned out that you were able to falsify them just by looking at the, or, or checking the extreme values on the, on the parameters. And SnobFit uh, actually did that when we, when we looked into what it was actually doing, if the sort of the, the objective function was flat, right? So it didn't have a really a good sense of direction that you get if you assign it a constant value one if it's false, if it's uh, satisfied and negative one if it's uh, not falsified. Uh, but but SnobFit is a very involved method having many different stages. Uh, so then then um, we 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 will did see could we come up with uh, another strategy that would sort of take this into account that we know that for these falsification methods, it makes a lot of sense to look at the different extreme values. 
So then, then uh, Sarah uh, or Sahara uh, started to uh, work on something that we call line search falsification, which is a gradient-free method, direct search, and it combines random exploration with local search. I, I should also say that uh, um, just using randomized methods work surprisingly well compared to using uh, these optimization methods. That 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 was also something that surprised us and. Uh, uh, and something that was not really uh, acknowledged in the in the in the research community. Um, so I, I don't have the graphs here, but 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 but, but these methods work quite good. But optimization, if you have a good optimization method, it will outperform these random methods. Uh, but we wanted to combine these random exploration with the local search and, and emphasizing these uh, exploring the values on, on, on the boundary. Uh, and something that you was also important we noticed was that to get out of the local optima because it's quite easy to get stuck in local optima. Um, and uh, the line search falsification is just a, a very simple method that will shoot the line in the n-dimensional parameter sp space in a random direction. Uh, and then it will uh, calculate extreme values uh, and then evaluate the function at um, the leftmost value, the rightmost value, and, and the midpoint. And then basically decide um, on, on what, what the objective value was to go either in the to the left on the line or to the right on the land on, on the line. And it will go on like this until um, uh, it can no longer improve. And then it will shoot from that point uh, uh, a new line in this n-dimensional that will go through the original point. So super simple method, uh, but uh, as we saw here, it uh, on, on these benchmark examples we have, it outperforms all other methods that we found in the in, in the literature. Um, uh, so I should maybe explain the, the graph here. So this is a cactus plot. So what we have on the on the on, on the x-axis here is the number of successful falsifications. So this is the number of problems where we can falsify it. And on the y-axis, we have the number of simulations that we need to falsify a certain problem. So, so uh, if we have a, a point here, so we look at the red graph, for example, it means that in, uh, what can it be, in 10, 10, 10 problems can be solved in, I think, in seven, using seven or less um, simulations. Uh, and the more simulations we do, the more problems we will be able to falsify. So that's why we see here. So if you go up here where we have 100 simulations, so we, we can see here that maybe around 70 of the problems we were, for, were able to falsify if uh, we allowed ourselves to do 100 simulations. Uh, and of course, a better performance here is that if you go towards the lower right corner, then those methods do better. So uh, that's why we see here that line search falsification overall performs better than SNOPFIT, which in turn performs better than LDMEED. Uh, and we have for each me method here, we also have uh, using the max and additive semantics. Uh, uh, and uh, there is a small advantage for additive, but but for these uh, problems, there was not a, a, a big difference. Uh, but we had another yeah, other benchmark problems where it, it matters a lot. Uh, so uh, and. When we then dived into this optimization literature, uh, we uh, came across uh, Bayesian optimization, which is a very hot area, um, sort of machine learning method used for hyperparameter optimization. So with Bayesian optimization, you, I mean, it, it's used a lot when you when you need to do black box optimization and where the objective function is expensive to evaluate. 
And that, that's a, a property that we have. So all these, it's quite expensive to do a simulation at Volvo. So it takes at least um, 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 a couple of minutes to do one single simulation. So you, you could afford yourself to, do, to have a little bit more involved optimization method because, because uh, doing these simulations are so expen expensive. Uh, and uh, with these Bayesian optimization methods, you, you uh, assume a statistical model and then you build up the surrogate function and these surrogate functions will uh, also in include the uncertainty of the function. Uh, and then you have an acquisition function where you try to decide on where to sample next. So yeah, I will not go into this, but you have what you see here is that you have in this case two observations, these black dots here, and then you build up this acquisition function and then you formulate, you do that some optimization on the acquisition function and that will decide on where you do your next sample. Uh, and then you, you, after you have done this observation, you uh, rebuild this surrogate function that you have built up and you, you uh, recalculate the acquisition function and decide on, on the, the next point. Uh, and then we uh, did some started some collaboration with uh, experts on, um, on Bayesian optimization from Lund University, Luigi Nardi and his colleagues. And they recommended a, a relatively new method, uh, which is called Turbo, uh, that is not only building up one surrogate function, instead it, it uh, builds up a number of different surrogate functions, which makes a lot of sense in our, uh, in our examples where the objective function can have discontinuities. For example, if you have a, a condition changes in, in the parameter space, then the, the value of the objective function could be completely different. So this is sort of built into this, this method to, to build up uh, when, you, when you build up these surrogate functions. And when we try this on, on the hard benchmark problems that we, we have that we are not really able to falsify with other methods, uh, so we see here we have this cactus plot again, uh, and uh, uh, we see here. So I said that more towards the lower right corner means that you have better performance. So we see here. So Turbo is this um, new algorithm that we are playing around with, playing around with, um, built on based on Bayesian optimization. And we can see here that uh, in 1,000 simulations, Turbo is able to falsify uh, 44 of our problems. But uh, with line search falsification, that was our best method before. We can do 33 or something like that. Uh, and if we go down to snob fit, it's 26 uh, and so on. So it's really interesting to see here that there seems to be some value in trying to learn the surrogate function because the more simulations, the larger simulation budget you have, uh, the more problems you're, you're able to falsify. Uh, so, um, yeah, Sarah are, are now working on, because there are many interesting problems here. How do you define the acquisition function? So you trade this exploration versus exploitation uh, in, in the best possible way. Um, so we, we see if we can use our insight from working with these falsification problems to, to, to do even better than we, what we did here with just sort of the standard or the default parameters. Uh, right, uh, however, there, there is one problem um, that turned out to be really hard to, to falsify in uh, among the benchmark problems that we have. Um, and this, um, so no matter which optimization method we work with or which semantics, we could not do a single falsification uh, of this example. Uh, and neither could any other tool uh, that were participated in the uh, a falsification uh, competition uh, where this um, problem were used. 
So the only method that could use it was uh, or could falsify it was uh, a gray box approach, where you basically combined that simulated annealing with optimal control, and the optimal control then had, yeah, it uh, yeah, had knowledge about the system, so it didn't treat it as a black box system. But when we looked at this um, uh, output that we got from from these this uh, optimal control approach. Uh, it had a, an interesting property, and that was that it did uh, go like a pulse. So you needed to go up and then down and up and down to to uh, trigger a certain behavior of the system. Uh, so so we we thought that it is so coming up with these. Um, Reasonable input generators is a relatively complicated problem uh, for the engineers. Uh, so, and and we, we would like them to be as simple as possible, uh, but still uh, being able to falsify the, the specification. So we started to play around with what can we what can we now get if we do all our inputs using these pulse generators. So. So for these pulse generators, so we have uh, yeah, basically five different uh, parameters. So we have uh, the amplitude and the period. We can also play around with changing the width. So how should it, long should it be high? We can also change the ba base value and when the, the signal should, should start. Uh, and it turns out that when we um, uh, combine um, pulse generator with optimization, we are act we are able to falsify not only this very very tricky problem, but also uh, um, um, more or less all other uh, benchmark problems. So it seems to be a very simple, uh, straightforward parametrization that is really useful in in capturing, um, or, yeah. Yeah, setting up inputs that are, that that are able to falsify uh, most of the specifications. So so we believe that this could also be a um, good input to to uh, our industrial partners how to to define these inputs. Uh, and when we combine this with Bayesian optimization, it turns turns out that we can can uh, define. The problem using all these di five different parameters and still be able to to falsify it more or less every time. Um, right. Uh, we see here um, something else that we um, have uh, looked into is to the, um, or that we thought were really important was to to extend the kind of benchmark problems that uh, are used in this falsification community. Because most of the problems that we have worked with that were used in this arch friendly competition were relatively few. You had, I mean, one or two inputs and a few parameters to choose, which is very, very different from uh, the industrial problems that, that have um, many inputs. I mean, between 10 and 100 different in inputs and maybe, yeah, then, then the number of control points for every input. Uh, so uh, something we did and, and published is a new benchmark uh, set uh, where we have these very, very large specifications. Uh, so um, that we think could also be, be useful to stimulate research in, in this important problem. Uh, and then we face another problem, and that is uh, uh, when we have a large number of specifications and we have a large number of, of parameters, then our dimensionality of the optimization problem becomes really, really high. Uh, so how could we reduce the dimensionality of the optimization problem? Uh, and something we uh, we have looked into is to, to do one fact factor experiments, changing one parameter at a time and then see which of the requirements are sensitive? So where does the robustness value change if we change the, those parameters? And when you have um, this many parameters, there are many specifications that are 
or many, yeah, many specifications that are not sensitive to all the different uh, control parameters. So that, so this we can use then to uh, to to as input to the optimizer to, to say that okay, you should focus on optimizing these these dif different parameters because you believe they are um, more you're more likely to to um, to 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 falsify your specifications if you focus on on those. Uh, and uh, this actually turned out uh, to be another good insight that we didn't really foresee, and that is that uh, a common problem is also that you have defined your requirements in in the wrong way. So you you would believe that the requirement would be sensitive to some parameter, but either you express the requirement in the wrong way, or you had some problem in your model that did not make it sensitive to. Uh, uh, to that parameter. So this this actually turned out to be quite um, valuable debug information to the developers. Uh, so they could, could, could check these things. Uh, and then something we so that you one is working on now. Uh, we just submitted a paper to HSCC about this is this multi requirement falsification. So when you have hundreds of specifications that for one model that you need to specify, but the traditional approach that were implemented in Breach and in SLRO is that you you try to falsify first specification one, and then you did that for a while, and then you focused on specification two and, and so forth. But uh, could we do a little bit better if we take all the requirements into account? Uh, and basically, he has uh, worked on a method called multi-requirement falsification that com combines um, this sensitivity analysis with something we call the focused falsification, uh, where you you always uh, you, you 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 where you adaptively switch between which specifications to. To, to focus on so that so when you focus on a specification, you use the robustness of that specification to. To 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 guide uh, where you. What what your next uh, sample will look like or what, what the kind of input parameters you, you should you should you should have. Uh, so uh, and uh, I don't have the, the numbers here, but he he, he has now quite. Um, Evident data that's that says that if you have a very large number of specifications, then then you you are able to use your simulation budget much more efficiently if you do it in this way. Uh, so uh, right, so we'll see. So I think this this will um, uh, bring me to our conclusions. So from uh, our um, our work with working with uh, Volvo cars here, we have observed a number of different things. And what I started out saying was that okay, we have models; they are available, but we don't we don't have them in a mathematical precise formulation. We can simulate them, but it's in, it's just a mix of different C code, Simulink, Simscape models, as, and so on. Uh, however, which was a, maybe a bit surprising that they actually did had have specifications, although they were in expressed using Simulink, Simulink and not in any more formal specification language. But as I, I talked about here, it, it turns out that it's actually possible to translate them into something uh, that is a bit more convenient for us to, to work with. And these specifications are, we have a large number of specifications and they are typically very, very complex. Um, and they have different initialization code and then they handle uh, many different cases here that, that makes it hard if you try to write them in a more low level uh, language, I would say. Uh, and these different um, input signals, they typically you have a large number of them and it results in a large number of uh, control points and these control points you have to, to optimize. And when you do optimization, you're always sensitive to the, 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 the number of dimensions of your optimization problem. So you try to, it's important to try to re reduce that. Um, 
and it's also expensive to simulate the, the system with new inputs. I mean, I, I talked about expensive in time, so it takes a number of minutes to, to do a, a simulation of, of the kind of systems that we have. So that also affects that we have to be a little bit careful in how many simulations we uh, we do, uh, and that's why it makes sense to try to have a little bit more involved uh, optimization method, like for example Bayesian optimization that we focus on now. And sort of what we have uh, seen in in this work is that, or what we have proposed is that um, how to how you define your objective function when you do the optimization. It can be done in many different ways. Uh, and, and we saw that this additive semantics is a, is a little bit, uh, it has a number of different advantages. It's especially, uh, we use it also in this sensitivity analysis where it's uh, clearly much better than the max semantics. Uh, uh, we saw that these uh, uh, testing problems, it makes a lot of sense to try to look at the extreme values. Um, so many problems can be falsified in that way, but for the more involved ones, of course, you have to go uh, to look uh, within those parameter ranges as well. And uh, what we are now doing is to focus on, on learning these surrogate functions uh, to guide the optimization. And, and we try to build upon what's used in Bayesian optimization. Uh, and Bayesian optimization is said to typically I uh, can handle dimensions up to 20 dimensions, but after that it doesn't work very well. So that's why we, we have looked into these other methods to try to reduce the number of parameters, for example, using uh, sensitivity analysis and the one factor experiments initially. And we also saw that it, it, uh, if you have a very large number of specifications, then you should probably do something uh, better than, than uh, trying to falsify them one by one. So, uh, uh, it's five o'clock. Um, I think this was. Um, short overview. I mean, it was, uh, I tried to give a overview of what we have been doing uh, and, and the problems we have faced. So if you have any Perfect. questions. Yep. Yes, thank you very much. So uh, 